the goal of internal alchemy, as opposed to the physical practice of turning lead into gold, is the development of spiritual gold, which is the soul. The ancient Egyptians were concerned with the afterlife, with acquiring, developing, and enhancing a vehicle to survive the passing of the physical vehicle or body. They wanted to nourish the soul and give the consciousness, the real you, the ability to achieve spiritual immortality rather than simply continuing the cycle of what Buddhists call reincarnation. To end this cycle of birth and death, the ancients believed that the soul must be pure enough, strong enough, and cannot be energetically depleted by sinful activity as I've briefly touched upon. The reason the God of Wisdom, Hermes or Thoth, is called three times great is because it references the three parts of man, the body, mind, and soul, and neither aspect of the three parts can be neglected or degraded. One should avoid smoking, excessive drinking, drugs, porn, and any activity that compromises one's integrity, and especially wasting of the vital energy through sinful activity, which does not mean evil, it just means performed improperly. This does not mean one should be abstinent, as there's more than one way to perform the act. It also does not mean one should not have kids, as there's 365 days in a year, and how many of those days does one need to spend spilling the cup of Hermes, so to speak, to make kids? If you have 10 wives and create 10 babies a year, that leaves 355 days of the year left, right? You could make 10 babies a year with 10 different women if you wish and have 355 days left over for retaining your vitality for other purposes other than procreation. So please don't say that this practice means sacrificing procreation somehow, which is just a justification of an addict that is frightened at the concept of giving up their addiction. If you only knew the exponential bliss that was available by not eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge, which incidentally is a metaphor for coitus, you would gladly consider the alternative way of performing the act. When Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi or fig tree, don't think he sat there with his eyes shut taking a nap, which is the modern view of meditation, as the tree was symbolic for the sacred act. So I'm not saying the key is abstinence at all, quite the opposite. It must be learned, take some discipline, but the rewards are worth it, at least according to the ancients, such as emperors, philosophers, alchemists, people like Nikola Tesla, Gandhi, Socrates, Leonardo da Vinci, the Dalai Lama, Plato, and many others. To enter the mystery school of Pythagoras required 40 days of fasting, and this did not mean refraining from food for 40 days, but abstaining from spilling the cup of Hermes, a practice familiar to many modern athletes who refrain before a big fight, as this gives them what they perceive to be a competitive edge. That same energy is what is harnessed for spiritual development, not just athletic performance. The last sentence speaks of the operation of the sun and is the true mystery behind why the pharaohs were considered sun gods and why they expected to live on in a godlike, immortal state in the astral realm after the bodies expired. In many esoteric interpretations of these ancient myths, the spilled semen is regarded as a great loss of spiritual vitality equated to death where the mystery is how to manipulate this orgasmic energy rather than expel it. In other words, circulate it up the spine to other chakra or endocrine centers, stimulating them and refining this energy into a creative potential, or describe this sum as a spiritual bliss that can last for many hours. According to the Bible, Jesus Christ was circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Until 1960, 
the Catholic Church celebrated this day as Circumcision Day. And in medieval times, the holy foreskin was worshipped in many European churches. According to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, it says, quote, And when eight days were fulfilled to circumcise the child, his name was called Jesus, the name called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The circumcision of Christ became a very common subject in Christian art from the 10th century onwards, one of numerous events in the life of Christ to be frequently depicted by artists. The circumcision controversy in early Christianity was resolved in the 1st century so that non-Jewish Christians were not obligated to be circumcised. Circumcision soon became rare in most of the Christian world except the Coptic Church of Egypt where circumcision was a tradition dating to pre-Christian times. Most rabbis, imams, and biblical scholars trace circumcision to an alleged covenant made between God and Abraham, as put forth in the book of Genesis. However, a bas relief on an Egyptian sarcophagus predating the accepted birth of Abraham shows male circumcision being practiced as a ritual prior to entry into the priesthood. According to mainstream academia, exactly when and why this practice started is debatable, but most anthropologists agree that its origin predates written history. That said, Christopher Columbus reported circumcision being practiced by Native Americans, and while this prompted many people to conclude that they were amongst the lost tribes of Israel, which may or may not be the case, I would argue against an old world origin since the Aztec, Maya, and even Inca also practiced a modified form of circumcision. In the case of the New World, the procedure was not exactly the same as practiced by modern Abrahamic faiths, as the rituals seemed to stem around bloodletting from the genitals performed upon the sons of what were described as, quote, great men rather than complete removal of foreskin, although the very tip may have been removed. Although the Inca are considered a technologically sophisticated culture that assembled the largest empire in the Western Hemisphere, they were the only major Bronze Age civilization that failed to develop a system of writing, so data concerning their rituals remain largely speculative. That said, the Inca seem to have arose from a prior South American culture which they conquered and may have adopted rituals from, which would explain this puzzling shortcoming which modern academia nowadays calls the Inca paradox. Circumcision has also traditionally been found among Samoan and other Pacific island cultures, which is associated with the rite of passage, sign of manliness, and sexual prowess. These pro-sexual reasons seem to be counterintuitive since the surgical procedure removes highly sensitive skin which many people conclude may in fact reduce sensitivity which may be a clue to the origin of this practice and its link to a priestly class. In antiquity, pre-Abrahamic faiths were closely tied to phallic symbolism. Fertility cults were common throughout Europe in pre-Christian times, with hundreds of stone phalluses having been found in Norway alone. There are symbolic representations of the male member, representing male potency, fertility, as well as spirituality. While many Jews, Christians, and Muslims will likely reject the link between sex and spirituality, one needs only to look at the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis, which, according to the Zohar, is not about a literal talking snake and an apple, but the forbidden fruit represents the orgasm, and the serpent represents the light bringer and the forces of enlightenment, in the context of Prometheus, also a light bearer and savior of mankind in Greek mythology. All forms of magic, regardless of intent, involves the harnessing and transmutation of sex energy, 
which is the true esoteric purpose for circumcision, which allegedly aids the practitioner in occult tantric practices, the idea being to redirect one's life force energy without prematurely expelling it via climax. That said, the next major event in the Egyptian saga involves an exodus of circumcised slaves out of Egypt, and the rest, as they say, is history. Most people are familiar with the story of Moses leading captive slaves out of Egypt, eventually settling in what is now modern Israel. The other name for this part of the Levant is called Palestine, which gets its name from the Philistines, also thought to be one of the Sea People. One of the twelve tribes that comprised what are known today as Israelites was the tribe of Dan, who were symbolically represented by the serpent and the color red. The most famous Philistine was Goliath, known for his giant stature, and the most famous Danite was Samson, known for his supernatural strength. The biblical account states that Samson was a Nazarite, one who has taken a voluntary vow of celibacy, abstains from alcohol, or at least grapes, and may not cut his hair, which is a sign of chastity and the source of his immense strength and virility, which allowed him to perform superhuman feats, including slaying a lion with his bare hands. His legendary power was drained from him when his hair was symbolically cut by Delilah, who was also a Philistine, and is often depicted nude in bed with Samson because the cutting of his hair represents the carnal act which weakened Samson's vril, or life force energy. Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word Nazar, meaning sacred, set apart, or separated. In other words, to abstain from, as in chastity. John the Baptist was also a Nazarite, and regardless of tribe, any Jewish person could become a Nazarite by an intentional verbal declaration, including children. Of course, Jesus himself is traditionally depicted with long hair, and usually with a beard, as many believe that he was a member of the Essenes, a Gnostic sect which also partook in vows of chastity, meaning they participated in esoteric tantra, and transmuted their sex energy into refined spiritual energy. The term Jesus of Nazareth is almost universally accepted in mainstream Christianity, as having to do with a town called Nazareth, which is not mentioned once in the Old Testament or in rabbinic literature, but sects of esoteric Christianity argue that Jesus, like John the Baptist, took the Nazarite vow. Samuel Ein Wyor is a proponent of this perspective and argues in his book, The Perfect Matrimony, The Door to Enter into Initiation, quote, Sexual magic is practiced in esoteric Christianity. Sexual magic is practiced in Zen Buddhism. Sexual magic is practiced amongst the initiated yogis. Sexual magic is practiced amongst the Muslim Sufis. Sexual magic was practiced in the initiate colleges of Troy, Egypt, Rome, Carthage, Eleusis. Sexual magic was practiced by the mysterious Maya, Aztec, Inca, Druids, etc. One of the most anticipated times of the year for such initiation rituals was around the time of the winter solstice, when the days shifted from being the shortest during the year to reversing and becoming incrementally longer, with the nights becoming shorter. This was symbolically seen as a time of resurrection in the northern hemisphere occurring during the sign of Capricorn, the goat, traditionally celebrated with 12 days of alcohol, 
drugs, and sex, which is why the goat is revered in occult organizations which practice sex magic, whether it be the ancient magi, the Knights Templar, or the followers of other ancient esoteric orders. The apron is declared to be an emblem of innocence. According to Manley Hall, when worn over the area related to the animal passions, the pure lambskin signifies the regeneration of the procreative forces and their consecration to the service of the deity. Though the apron clearly has roots in the old world, there is still a significant correlation in the book of Genesis. According to Masonic author Dr. J. A. Weiss, the Masonic apron originated from the covering or apron of fig leaves adopted by Adam and Eve after the fall. For after partaking of the forbidden fruit, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Thus, we see that the apron might also be said to symbolize the knowledge of good and evil, and, as Hall pointed out, the regeneration of the procreative force resultant from this knowledge. Naked is used as a description 104 times in scripture, and in this context has to do with sexual sin. It does not mean that they were physically naked without clothing, but rather that their spiritual condition had been exposed. They felt shame for their sexual sin and were in a state of intellectual and psychological ignorance, a dumbed down state, spiritually speaking, depleted of their higher vitality and creative life force energy, which in the East is known as chi or ki, in India is called prana, and some European alchemical groups called it vril. To members of secret societies or all ancient mystery school religions, the serpent was telling Adam and Eve to touch the fruit, but as God instructed, don't eat of it, and their eyes will be open, meaning partake in sexual relations with each other, be in a state of love or making love, but do not go all the way. Try to stay at third base as long as you can without having a home run, if that makes sense. This prolonged state has the same effect on the central nervous system as taking drugs and can lead to mystical experiences, heightened psychic abilities, and rather than expelling the sex energy, transforming it into more subtle forms of spiritual energy, creativity, ambition, drive, and literally genius. Of course, Adam and Eve did not listen. They went all the way, so to speak, and this is represented by the fall and resulted in their expulsion from the garden. So the esoteric tantric interpretation is not to completely avoid carnal activity, but to learn to separate the function that leads to procreation, which expels the life force energy, and instead to harness the energy to nourish the soul. To all ancient mystery religions, all of them, without any exception, the idea was that this bioelectromagnetic energy, when refined and transmuted, fortifies the soul so that it can retain consciousness after physical death. This was the esoteric purpose of circumcision, which predates all Abrahamic faiths and has recently been detected on the mummy of Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep I using a 3D CAT scan. The findings were reported in the journal Frontiers in Medicine. That said, an ancient silver bowl found in Tibet dated to the 5th century shows Alexander the Great three times, once touching fruit from the tree of life but not eating it, and twice drinking from the fountain of life in what appears to be a garden, exposing his circumcised member, which was not a habit known among Macedonians, but Alexander the Great himself was Arian, a student of Aristotle and initiate of the mystery school religion. Arian is a word that predates Sanskrit itself, and in Proto-Indo-Iranian denotes nobility. For example, Gautama Buddha was an Arian born into a noble caste. In Hebrew, Ari means lion. 
the symbol that is on many European flags representing the Aryan nobility that entered Europe, as in the line of Judah, as the Israelite religion itself also stems from the prehistoric solar religion where the line represents the sun in its most exalted state, symbolic of spiritual light and illumination. Esoteric Christianity represents the unveiled teachings of the mysteries of the gospel normally concealed to the public. In 200 AD, St. Clement of Alexandria wrote in his book, The Stromata, quote, The mysteries of the faith are not to be divulged to all. It is requisite to hide in a mystery the wisdom spoken, which the Son of God taught. St. Clement, also known as Clement of Alexandria, was a Christian theologian and philosopher, familiar with the classical Greek philosophy and literature, as well as pre-Christian Jewish esotericism and Gnosticism. In one of his works, he argued that Greek philosophy had its origin among non-Greeks, claiming that both Plato and Pythagoras were taught by Egyptian scholars. According to St. Clement, who is regarded as a church father, there are mysteries within the Christian doctrine, and they are not normally exposed unless you've had some type of special teaching. We can find this sentiment mirrored in the New Testament itself in Matthew 13, quote, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Many people seem to think that these mysteries are exposed by simply reading the Bible, but the word mystery means something of which initiation is necessary, a secret doctrine. In other words, no matter how high your IQ is, you can't just figure it out unless it's explained to you by someone that knows the esoteric content. The word esoteric has the root eso, which means interior or within. Esoteric, coming from the Greek word esoterikos, means intended to be revealed only to the initiated of a group, understood or meant for only the select who have special knowledge or interest, belonging to the select few. While this degree of secrecy might strike some as being deceptive, the idea was, at least in antiquity, that during this time, it was very important to withhold the esoteric doctrine from those not yet ready for it, and instead to give them a teaching that would help to prepare them. And for those that were prepared, the inner esoteric doctrine was revealed. The very nature of the Bible and many other ancient scriptures is that both of these teachings are within the same books within the same scriptures. As Jesus stated, those that have ears to hear it and eyes to see it, they see the level of teaching that they can comprehend. As St. Paul states, some are not yet ready for the meat. They are not ready for the solid food. They are ready for the milk. Quote, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. So, this is the way it has been for a long time. Unfortunately, the modern forms of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism that are popular and prevalent deny an esoteric aspect to the symbolism which they interpret at face value. Just as the Zohar has stated, what happens is that they inherit only the cloak, the veneer, the outer dress of the teachings, which are good, but only for a certain level. They have lost the inner doctrine, the esoteric form of Christianity. If you literally read the Bible, you'll find all sorts of contradictions. For someone who critically analyzes that, if there's no inner teaching, all that can be seen is something that contradicts itself or something that appears superficial. This is the main reason why many people have left their traditional religion, because 
they can only find the lower level, the milk, and they're ready to receive the meat. That said, while there may have once been legitimate reasons to have an inner doctrine, veiled from the general public and from power structures that employed corporal punishment, times have changed, and in the modern age of information, I believe it's important to properly interpret and disseminate the occult information, because not everybody that claims to possess the inner teachings legitimately has them, and those that do have exploited this knowledge to further a political agenda and not a spiritual one. In traditional forms of Christianity, because Jesus died on the cross, all of our sins are washed away, and all that is required is faith, or good works based upon faith, for the removal of our guilt, making the sinner righteous again. This is viewed in the exoteric way as a historical fact. From an inner or esoteric perspective, while the events 2,000 years ago attributed to Jesus are still revered, all of this must be understood as something happening within the individual and relevant today. Those events of the New Testament are pointing towards spiritual realities that must occur within ourselves. All of the characters of the Bible are related to certain aspects of ourselves. So, from an esoteric perspective, what is meant by the world is our own inner world. Esoteric Christianity views the soul as something that must be worked on, must be developed, and that effort other than faith alone is necessary for spiritual salvation. Unlike the traditional forms of Abrahamic religions, it is understood in the esoteric or Gnostic forms that we can know and experience God directly. This is one of the main differences. The church, synagogue, or mosque as a middleman is not necessary, as even a beach can be one's temple. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge, and the idea that there's a spark of divinity within us that can provide us with knowledge of the divine. This is something that many ancient church fathers also agreed with. Justin Martyr was an early Christian philosopher who lived during the 2nd century AD. The first apology, his most well-known text, passionately defends the morality of the Christian life and provides various ethical and philosophical arguments to convince the Roman Emperor to abandon the persecution of the Church. Quote, and when we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into the heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter. He also indicates, as St. Augustine would later, that the true religion, or Quote, seeds of Christianity actually predated Christ's incarnation. He was referring to what the Greeks called Gnosis and the Kabbalists called Light. In The Perfect Matrimony, Samuel Ein Wyor said, The sexual impulse is an illuminating factor. It is always a type of light. If you expel the light, you are full of darkness. People think after the orgasm that now that agitation is gone, so one feels relaxed again. But that's not really what's happening. This is like a person walking into a room. They turn the lights on, and they see something horrific. They get scared, and then they turn off the lights, and they think, oh, everything is better. Actually, everything is the same, just there's no light to see. Every time you orgasm, you're turning the lights off. Then, little by little, the energy accumulates again. The orgasm is a great exchange of temporary sensations for long-term ignorance, darkness, and desire. We also mistake that the sensation of dullness is happiness. The more you begin to transform your sexual energy and try to eliminate your desires, the more that light of your transformed sexual impulse is going to illuminate deeper factors within yourself you're going to continue to see more and more things within your mind. Every time you spill the energy, 
you're removing the ability for you to connect very powerfully with God. The transformation of our sexual impulse is the very connection. This is the very type of energy that allows us to receive and send the information between us as soul and spirit. Our energy is like a fluidic transceiver, like an antenna that is made out of fluid. And that fluid is all of our nervous energies. Not nervous as in anxious, but as in our nervous system. When you transmute sexual energy, your whole body becomes an antenna for receiving the signals, for receiving the beauty of the world. Then you are tapped into a limitless, universal nature of compassion. When you are tapped into that, the small types of trivial things do not upset us so much and we find a wellspring of happiness, of joy, of beauty, of knowledge coming from within ourselves. The doctrine of sexual transmutation is at the very essence, the very core, the very beginning of esoteric Christianity. Matthew 19 talks about eunuchs, but this needs to be understood symbolically. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, only they to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs who were made eunuchs of men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. The context of this verse is about energy transmutation, not literal castration. To not only use the energy to procreate, and instead use the energy for developing the soul. Of course, the esoteric doctrine has never been for everybody, but there are those that believe that everybody has the right and the capacity to walk this path if they choose to, and at the very least, be exposed to it academically. Today we have profound difficulty associating sexuality with anything sacred, but in ancient times, the worship of the goddess was often conducted through sexual rites, where carnal acts conducted in a specific way, which in modern times is most commonly referred to as Tantra, allegedly can lead one to enlightenment, which is often called Gnosis, and also has an equivalent Gnostic state that is revered by Sufis, Kabbalists, Taoists, or Tibetan monks, shamans, Wiccans, alchemists, mystery school religions, and various occult organizations collectively known as secret societies. That said, sexually induced trance states are also attained in mystic Christianity, but is obviously considered heresy by mainstream churches. In an ancient Aryan context, which are at the root of esoteric Hinduism and Buddhism, the right and left path are viewed as equally valid approaches to enlightenment, with the left-hand path being considered faster, but also considered more dangerous and not suitable for all initiates. That said, the left is usually associated with the goddess. According to the Encyclopedia of Tibetan Symbols and Motifs, quote, In Buddhist Tantra, the right hand symbolizes the male aspect of compassion or skillful means, and the left hand represents the female aspect of wisdom or emptiness. In both Hinduism and Buddhism, the goddess is always placed on the left side of the male deity, where she sits on his left thigh, while her lord places his left arm over her left shoulder and dallies with her breast. In representations of the Buddha image, the right hand often makes an active mudra of skillful means, the earth touching, protection, fearlessness, wish granting, or teaching mudra, while the left hand often remains in a passive mudra of meditative equipose, resting in the lap and symbolizing meditation on emptiness or wisdom. Tantra uh, etymologically derives from a word rep meaning to extend, to stretch. So essentially the Buddhist Tantras, which were a set of texts that appeared in India between the 6th and the 10th century, 
were methodologies, practices, as well as sort of a philosophical view that differed quite distinctly from earlier forms of Tibetan monasticism. And they were ways of bringing about uh, methods that included sensuality, uh, the senses in a much more dynamic way on the, on the spiritual path. Many of the objects that we see in Tibetan art are in what is called yabyum, which is literally a uh, conjoined uh, sexual embrace that symbolizes not just the unity of sensuality on the spiritual path, as is commonly seen, but more importantly and esoterically, it's the union of opposites in, the, in a kind of Jungian sense, if you will. Also in Tibetan art, not only do we see figures in entwined sexual union, but we also see them manifesting very fiercely and wrathfully. So generally the purpose of these wrathful tantric deities is to cut through the, the conceptual mind. The most effective method for awakening one's consciousness unites three ancient methods utilized by Sufis, monks, and yogis, which is why he referred to it as the fourth way. Gurdjieff argued that many of the existing forms of religious and spiritual tradition on earth had lost their connection with their original meaning and vitality, and so could no longer serve humanity in the way that had been intended at their inception. As a result, humans were failing to realize the truths of ancient teachings and were instead becoming more and more like automatons, susceptible to external control. At best, the various surviving sects and schools could provide only one-sided development. Instead of developing body, mind, or emotion separately, this method attempted to work on all three to promote comprehensive and balanced inner development. Semen retention and transmutation of sex energy was paramount to his higher level teachings, as it is to all schools of alchemy, secret societies, original Buddhist and Taoist philosophies, all Aryan and mystery school religions, including mystic Christianity, and the Sufi, monk, and yogi masters that comprised the three ancient paths Gurdjieff expanded on. He believed in harnessing one's life force to produce what he called a, quote, finer energy to nourish higher spiritual development. Gurdjieff was of the opinion that sexual energy in the modern Western world was misused in the pursuit of personal pleasure and gratification. He claimed that, in general, the only two proper ways of expending sexual energy were through a conventional sex life or through spiritual transmutation. When his students inquired about the value of celibacy in the process of spiritual transformation to create a, quote, astral body, the alchemical transmutation of coarse matter into fine matter, Gurdjieff gave a very nuanced and informed answer. Quote, Sexual abstinence is necessary for transmutation only in certain cases, that is, for certain types of people. For others, it is not at all necessary. And with yet others, it comes by itself when transmutation begins. I'll explain this more clearly. For certain types, a long and complete sexual abstinence is necessary for transmutation to begin. This means, in other words, that without a long and complete sexual abstinence, transmutation will not begin. But once it has begun, abstinence is no longer necessary. In other cases, that is, with other types, transmutation can begin in a normal sexual life and on the contrary can begin sooner and proceed better with a very great outward expenditure of sex energy. In the third case, the beginning of transmutation does not require abstinence, but having begun, transmutation takes the whole of sexual energy and puts an end to normal sexual life or the outward expenditure of sex energy. Gurdjieff was a vigorous, charismatic man with a robust sexual nature, described by biographer James Webb as a sensual man who enjoyed the pleasures of the bed as much as those of the table. Gurdjieff's sexual conduct shocked many people in the 1920s and 1930s, especially in conservative America. 
There were rumors that he had a highly varied sex life and was involved in unusual sexual activities. Some claimed he was a master of exotic tantric sexual practices learned in the East. He clearly possessed a sophisticated and nuanced understanding of the role of sexuality in the process of spiritual transformation and enunciated a complex model of the transmutation of sexual energy to a higher developmental level. At times he was celibate, at other periods highly sexually charged. His sexual life was strange in its unpredictability. At certain times he led a strict, almost ascetic life, having no relation with women at all. At other times, his sex life seemed to go wild, and it must be said that his unbridled periods were more frequent than the ascetic. At times, he had sexual relationships not only with almost any woman who happened to come within the sphere of his influence, but also with his own pupils. Right work on oneself, Gurdjieff taught, begins with the creation of a permanent center of gravity, a task which is supported by the correct use of sexual energy. The role of the sex center in creating a general equilibrium and a permanent center of gravity can be very big. Almost everyone who met Gurdjieff was struck by his powerful personality and commanding presence. Together his physical attributes, personal magnetism, and immense knowledge created an impression of great strength and mastery. Gurdjieff possessed an enigmatic quality and a mystique that set him apart from other men. The widely held belief that he possessed hypnotic and psychic powers only deepened his aura of mystery. His alleged use of these abilities as part of his teaching, condemned in some traditional spiritual circles, has always been a source of controversy. Gurdjieff possessed an undeniable personal power and magnetism. The sheer force of his presence made a lasting impact on others. Student Henry at Lons describes the impression Gurdjieff made at their first meeting. I was struck by the impact of his force, very quiet, calm and controlled, yet almost frightening, but more than anything by the degree of his total presence, a presence which I felt extended to the tips of his fingers. It gave meaning to all his movements, which seemed so much more alive than ours. As alive as those of a cat or a tiger. I also felt very strongly his vast generosity, a generosity which I would call superhuman. Of course, Gurdjieff also addressed non-carnal techniques for cultivating bio-electromagnetic energy, otherwise known as chi, ki, prana, or vril. For example, he noticed that the completion of small, voluntary tasks with focus gives one immense power, confidence, charisma, and magnetism. Quote, To undertake voluntary aim, and to achieve it gives magnetism and the ability to do. It is gained only through conscious labor and intentional suffering, through doing small things voluntarily. Make some small aim your God, and you will be going toward acquiring magnetism. Like electricity, magnetism can be concentrated and made to flow. Whether it be the Iranian Mithraic Mysteries, or the Greek Eleusian mysteries, the end phenomena is the same and cannot be explained academically, but must be experienced subjectively, which is the big secret at the core of all ancient mystery school religions, that while the universe appears to be comprised of many separate individual moving parts, this is an illusion, and the underlying truth is that everything is connected that the universe itself is of one mind, one soul, experiencing itself through a multitude of different perspectives. The most notable theme of the mysteries is the experience of death before death. This means that the rituals were meant to induce epiphanies of the afterlife by making the participant experience a mind-expanding psychedelic voyage, often by ingesting a beverage which in the Greek version of the ritual was called kaikion, which was made of barley and mint, but also infused with psychotropic fungus ergot, known to produce LSD-like effects. And this, then, heightened the experience and helped transform the initiate. After drinking it, the participants entered the telesterion, an underground theater where the secret ritual took place which involved ritualistic acts and resulted in ecstatic bliss, 
where the initiate could temporarily transcend mortal existence and merge with the cosmic mind. The climax of the ritual is the experience of dying without actually dying and coming back to daily life with this knowledge and without sharing it with anyone. Those who entered in would come out the next morning radically changed. Virtually every important thinker and writer in antiquity, anyone who was anyone, was an initiate of the mysteries. One of the most reputable historians in the world, Will Durant, states of the mysteries, quote, In this ecstasy of revelation, they felt the unity of God and the oneness of God and the soul. They were lifted up out of the delusion of individuality and knew the peace of absorption into deity. Cicero, a Roman statesman familiar with the Eleusian mysteries, writes, quote, Nothing is higher than these mysteries. They have not only shown us how to live joyfully, but they have taught us how to die with a better hope. The mystic person was one who had experienced the secrets, but would not share them verbally. Instead, the mystic preferred to offer the experience itself to those who were prepared. That said, you do not need to use any psychedelics to have access to the mysteries. And after the initiate learns how to activate and navigate the internal landscape, they can then manipulate it in a way to induce a specific type of transformative experience that could be revisited mentally even without the use of any mind-expanding substance. Albert Pike described this force saying, it is the instrument of liberty or free will. They, the initiates, represent this force which presides over the physical generation under the mythologic and horned form of the god Pan. Thence came the he-goat of the Shabbat, brother of the ancient serpent, and the light-bearer, or phosphor, of which the poets have made the false Lucifer of the legend. So simply put, the apron can be said to symbolize the occult power of its bearer, and consecration of the serpentine energy for constructive use. The goat is one of the most popular Masonic animals, an association which has been the cause of much speculation and controversy. One accusation, which is vehemently denied, is that part of the initiation involves riding a goat. The standard explanation is given in Masonry Defined, which claims it harkens back to the Middle Ages and the belief in the witch orgies, where, it was said, the devil appeared riding on a goat. It was in England a common belief that the Freemasons were accustomed in their lodges to raise the devil. So the riding of the goat, which was believed to be practiced by the witches, was transferred to the Freemasons, and the saying remains to this day. Zodiacally, the home of Saturn, the origin of our Satan, is Capricorn, pictured in the firmament by a goat. The goat is the symbol of evil, and riding the goat signifies that temptations have been vanquished, the devil overcome, and the animal instincts sublimated into spiritual assets. Some detractors have suggested that riding the goat has some sort of sexual connotation. Looking at these pictures, and reading such stories as told by Brother Lomas, who truly is to be blamed for such suspicions? Albert Pike already provided us a significant clue when he mentioned that the initiates represent this force which presides over the physical generation under the mythologic and horned form of the god Pan. Thence came the he-goat of the Shabbat. These pictures then, along with the others, may be interpreted as an initiation of the occult power of generativity, that serpent of the Kundalini. But there are other clues to the goat's identity. In the poem, The Goat, we read that the goat rewards the pursuit of masonry, but punishes one for engaging in worldly things, including prayer. Smoking, however, is apparently condoned, along with alcohol. There was one stunt in particular entitled, Drinking the Goat's Blood. The symbolism behind this is obvious, but there is no need to speculate, for the liner notes of the catalog state that, 
There can be no more appropriate ceremony than serving the candidate with the blood of the animal, in order that he might be thoroughly imbued with the spirit and life of the organization. This significant statement brings us to our final interpretation, and it is this. The goat is the mode of power upon which its rider travels. And what is this power? It has already been thoroughly elucidated, but to recap, it is associated with Pan, the he-goat, and the ancient serpent, with Phosphor, the light-bearer, yea, Lucifer. Of course, there's a lot of reservation around the word Lucifer, which literally means light-bearer, but over the centuries has come to be associated with the Prince of Darkness. While the planet Venus is traditionally portrayed as a goddess, such as Inanna by the Sumerians or Aphrodite by the Greeks, in its morning appearance, the Greeks refer to Venus as Phosphorus, which is what is meant by the term morning star and is depicted as a torch-bearing man. In the northern hemisphere, Venus appears most brightly in the sky in December because the days are shortest at that time signaling a beginning of the rebirth phase of the sun, where the days would get longer and winter would end. Ancient mystery religions, or as anthropologists like to say, fertility cults, engaged in alchemical rituals where sacred sex rites at this time. During the sign of Capricorn the goat, which the powers that be outlawed for the general public, and so Luciferianism was banned by the Pope and punishable by death, usually by being burned alive, as was the fate of the Cathars and Templars, both of whom partook in achieving altered Gnostic trance-like states of consciousness, in most cases through tantric sex, and were labeled as heretical, evil, sinful, witches, and the philosophy was forced to go underground in the form of alchemy, which is not really about the transmutation of metal, but the transmutation of carnal lust into spiritual gold, as well as secret societies, which at one time were set up to defend freedom and liberty, both politically and spiritually, but have long since been infiltrated and corrupted, now in servitude to those same suppressive forces that they were initially set up to resist.